Well, I've heard my name. It's pretty much all I understood. Uh, so I assume that means my turn. So good morning, everyone. I'm happy to see so many of you here. How many people do we actually have? Uh, do we have a number ish? Uh, more than 200. More than 200. Wow. That's a lot of people. <laughs> well, uh, I assume you got a short introduction. I heard my name, and then he spoke some more, and then I heard my name again. But, uh, so anyway, my name is uh, Magnus Hagener. Uh, I'm a member of the Postgres core team. I'm one of the committers. Uh, I'm also on board of Postgres Europe. So I'm sort of involved in all the sorts of different uh, little of the open organizations. Uh, I've been working with Postgres for a long time. I think I had my first patch in Postgres back in, it was 95 or 96, which is, you know, back when it wasn't really all that much fun to run it in production. Up until today when it's awesome to run it in production, right? Uh, when I don't work on the pure open source project, I work for a company called Red Bill Infra. It's an uh, open source consulting and services company in the Scandinavian region. I'm out of uh, Stockholm in Sweden myself. So, you know, right next doors uh, here, though it is my first time in uh, St. Petersburg. So, out of curiosity, for the people here in the room, how many of you have previously been to any sort of PG Day or Postgres conference or anything like that? Anyone? Yeah, that's not a lot of people. Well, I'm glad to see so many new people here, and, you know, big hand to these guys for actually pulling this together. It seems to be a very successful first attempt at a PG Day uh, here in Russia with, you know, this many people on the first try. So, uh, I certainly hope you guys can keep that up, and uh, we get more chances to show. So, anyway, to some actual content, right? Uh, I'm here to talk about security. Uh, and, you know, let's start with a simple, you know, the simple fact. Security is hard, right? Does anyone think security is not hard? Uh, we have all sorts of, you know, wholesome tools, but it's really hard. Even though we have all the tools, actually doing things right and using them the right way is really, really hard. We have so many examples of everyone knows, you know, to get certification you need to use 128-bit encryption. So you invent your own encryption algorithm, that's 128-bit, and then, you know, you store your keys on a uh, post-it note on your front door, uh, and things like that. Uh, and the other important thing to know about security is there really is no one solution. So you're not going to end up here with, no, here's a nice recipe, here's how you make sure that your system is secure, because it's not that easy. In fact, there's never just one requirement. And that's the other bigger thing. All different systems have very different requirements. Uh, I see far too many, you know, you can, you can read a book that says, you know, here's how you make your system secure. You can go to a training that says, you know, here's how you build a secure web application or whatever, but it really isn't that simple because what security means and what a secure deployment means is different for every single system. Yes, some systems are of the kind that, you know, the network should never pass outside the walls of the room that the server is in. Most people don't have that requirement. In fact, that would be a bad requirement for most of you because you are probably serving up applications to customers, whether they're internal or external, and you don't want them all in one single room because it will be very crowded, at least if you're successful. If you have only one customer, then maybe it would work, but uh, you probably don't aim for that. Whereas if you're in some areas of you know, really high security corporations or high security government installations, it really is just that. Maybe not one room, but maybe one building. And that's a different kind of security requirement, right? Uh, and what Postgres does around this in general is it tries to provide you with a toolbox. And there's actually a lot of different security features in Postgres. Uh, you probably don't need all of it. In fact, some of you may not need that. Actually, uh, you need some of it. Like everybody needs some of it. But most of you probably don't need the majority of what's actually in the toolbox. But it's there. And you can sort of pick and choose. And that's really where it, what it's all about. It's about trying to figure out which parts of the toolbox should you be using at all and how to use them. Because it's more important to pick a couple of good tools from the toolbox and use them right, than to just pick every single tool and just randomly throw it into the system and see what happens, basically. Which is, unfortunately, something I think we see a lot today in many applications, whether on Postgres or not, that people just sort of find every kind of security feature they possibly can and just enable it, without really thinking and without really planning. Uh, so, this talk's supposed to be about secure Postgres deployment, and that's really the general idea here, which means I'm going to talk a little about, about you know, securing Postgres environments, um, securing communications and authentication and user management in Postgres. 
Uh, what I'm explicitly not going to talk about is secure Postgres applications. Of course, if you actually want a secure system, you need both of them. Right? Uh, but things like authorizations and permissions and roles and you know, security barrier stuff and role level security and all that kind of thing, it's more of an application architecture thing. That's also important, but that's not what we're going to talk about today. Uh, this is more about the actual deployment of Postgres and sort of the system level features uh, that you really want to do. And the first thing you need to think about when you're trying to make a sort of secure Postgres deployment is really having a secure Postgres environment, right? If you're deploying Postgres in an insecure environment, it will not be secure. Simple as that. Uh, you cannot get past that. Sort of the basic, if someone is root on your operating system, there's nothing you can do. They've already won. Likewise, if someone has physical access to your server, well, then they can become root, and then they've already won. Or, again, if someone actually has physical access to the data center that the server is in, then yeah, you may have it in a locked rack, but has anyone ever tried to pick the lock on one of these little door things on a rack? I've had to do that due to lost keys, and it's actually not that hard. If someone's in the data center, they know everything, they own everything. There's a matter of setting up sort of a layer of trust, uh, because you have to trust someone. You can build everything, you can everything and you know, lock your building so that only you can get in and design your own locks and all that kind of stuff. But you're not going to do that. You're going to get in at sort of a reasonable level. <clears throat> the other thing that I see a lot of people are missing in, in this whole sort of pure environment part is you need to really define your trust levels when you're working with something like outsourcing or just server hosting. You're placing your server in somebody else's data center. Do you know their security practices? Do you know who they're hiring? You know, if they do you no know, security checks on their employees, some data centers will actually publish exactly what kind of security checks they do on their employees, and some won't. If your system actually needs security, maybe you should be looking for that. If you're using a cloud vendor, do you know what their security practices are? Because that's just a sort of a massive size of, of outsourcing, which is, I mean, anyone who has, you know, root on an Amazon box, on the actual box, will implicitly have root on every single virtual machine running on Amazon. <coughs> That's a lot of power. Now, Amazon actually has very good you know, employee security standards, and it's not very easy to get root on an Amazon box. But it's still it's a level of trust that between you and your provider that really needs to be part of when you're designing the environment. Because if you cannot trust that level, then there's really not much point in anything else you do. Because now you have a very weak spot where people can break into your system or do whichever they want. Uh, and so the next step down is, you know, choose the right operating system, right? This is where people love to have one of those, yeah, never choose this, everybody should use OpenBSD or whatever, you know? Use whichever one you prefer. Actually, use whichever one you know, right? Somebody who knows how to, you know, securely deploy, say, a Red Hat system, will deploy that more secure than that person will deploy OpenBSD. Someone who actually knows how to deploy OpenBSD really securely would probably make even a slightly better job but you need something that matches up with your skill set. Same thing, if you're, if you're a 99% Windows organization, you hopefully have people who know how to secure Windows deployments, they're going to do a better job of that than they are going to do on securing a Red Hat installation. Because they don't know how to do it, they don't have the experience, they don't have the tools and things like that. So it's really important to make sure you use something you know. If you start with something that you don't know, then you're likely to make mistakes. And a single tiny mistake will just ruin sort of everything else that you were doing. Uh, and secure it at a reasonable level. Right? There are things you should do, but in general, most operating systems as we get there today are secure enough from an operating system perspective for running your database on. Right? If you're using something like Windows, well, they have templates that will set, you know, yes, this is a server and it's going to be secure, and those defaults are pretty good these days. If you're installing Red Hat or Debian or FreeBSD or whatever, the, the actual operating system level defaults are reasonably secure on pretty much everything. You're probably more likely to mess things up if you start changing them. However, that's sort of rule number one for any sort of secure deployment, no other local users on your database <coughs> server. Right? Well, your DBA, actually maybe not even your DBAs, but sometimes your DBAs, but nobody else. Yes, there has to be a root account. <coughs> But that's pretty much it. Don't let your users log into the server. Don't let just like random end users. Don't run your application whereby users SSH into the server and run something. Use the other sort of network layer securities between that instead. Because if you just get them right in there, there are many ways 
to get into the system. And now suddenly you have to spend a lot more effort on securing your operating system and securing your Postgres installation that you just don't have to do if you make sure that you don't have untrusted users on the system. It just opens up more attack vectors. Uh, when putting Postgres on top of your operating system, always use the standard installers if they are available, whichever platform you're on. Right? Don't go rack your own. Yes, Postgres is open source, you can build from source, you do it if you have to, but as a general rule, it's just don't go inventing your own things when they're there. If you're on Red Hat, use the RPMs, use the right? If you're on Debian, use the Debian app get and things like that. If you're on Windows, use the package Windows installers. If you're on FreeBSD, use the ports installer. Because the guys who set those up actually know their operating systems very well. So they've set it up with good defaults. You're, again, much more likely to mess things up if you change it. <clears throat> it gives you also a, a sort of consistent security model across the operating system because they're integrating. Say you're using again on Red Hat, for example. Well, the Postgres packages will set the correct uh, SE Linux context on files so that you don't end up with the classic Red Hat thing, which is, you know, oh, things don't work, and then turn off SE Linux. Oh, it works. Okay, let's leave it off. But if you're actually installing, you know, the approved RPM packages, they will set those things right and you can keep running with SE Linux enabled, and it'll help protect the rest of your system. And that's sort of a general thing. The other thing that you get with us, and this is probably from, from all the things I meet of my different customers, probably the biggest mistake that pretty much everybody makes, keep yourself updated. Right? Do not run on a four-year-old Postgres minor release. Like eight, four, th I ran into an 8.4.4 or 8.4.3 just a couple weeks ago, our customers. There's, there's a multitude of security fixes. There's a bunch of other fixes as well, but from a security perspective, there's a bunch of fixes you just don't have. You're open to no attack vectors. Make sure that you keep yourself updated. And this obviously also includes the operating system. Again, in these four years, there have been quite a few security fixes to whether it's Red Hat or Debian or you know, BSD. There's been a lot of them. If you don't apply them, you're open to known attack vectors. And that's just silly. Uh, you know, if you're using something like Yammer app, it just makes this easier because it's automatic. You can easily monitor it, you know, plug it into your Nagios or whatever you're using, and it'll just alert saying, hey, the security fix is available, you should probably go install them. And, you know, as with all Nagios alerts, you all, you know, snap to attention and do it immediately, right? It's not how it works, but we can try. Uh, try to get sort of the next level uh, under that. Uh, the, on the topic of encrypting the storage of Postgres, uh, you can do it, right? Postgres stores all its files in a file system. So as long as you have an encrypting file system, you'll fix that, right? You will get, get performance implications, obviously. You may get reliability implications. You really need to look into your specific encrypted file system. There may be options that you have to set to make sure it works synchronously so that you can actually uh, trust the data. But, of course, the problem is even worse performance. But the thing to really think about is how do you deal with key management of an encrypted file system? Like what happens when you restart the server? If you're actually storing the key on the server, you might as well not bother encrypting it. Because if the, the encrypted file system is there to protect you against someone physically stealing the server, right? Which is probably not that common. It's more common with an encrypted file system on a laptop, which gets stolen all the time. But if you actually have your key, even on a USB key that's stuck into the server, you know, if they're going to steal the server, they're going to steal the USB key. It's right there. They're not going to bother taking it out you know, and leaving it on your table. So key management is really the whole point. So what you need is offline. You might want to keep your key on a USB stick, but then every time you reboot the server, someone has to walk into the data center and plug it in. If that's the kind of security requirement you have, absolutely do it. But you probably don't have that. And again, just storing the keys on the server makes it completely pointless, and you're paying a fairly large overhead uh, in just encrypting the disk. So you should probably not do that at the time. Uh, now, there's a slight uh, diverging on this thing that might be worth note, uh, thinking about. is multiple instances. If you're running more than one Postgres instance on the same host, now, in most cases, you probably don't. Right? If you have a single application on your server, it's a large-scale application. But if you have like multi-tenancy hosting or something like that, if you're running completely independent Postgres instances, you should probably have different operating system users for them. So normally you have an operating system user called Postgres that runs the server. If you install a second instance from a security perspective, you should not have a Postgres 2 or whatever you want to call it. Or you know, let's call it Ingress just to confuse people or Oracle or something like that. 
you know, try to hack something else. Now, this is usually doesn't work too well with the package system because they're all hard coded to whatever user they have. So you'll do things like you know, edit the init script to make it work. Uh, but doing that will isolate them much more. Or in fact, uh, other things that we have, you might want to consider like virtualization or containerization just to keep these things even more apart, to separate them properly. Because if you have two servers running as the same user, you're actually the super user in one of the systems can easily hack the other system because there's no operating system level security between them. And that's probably not a good idea. But actually getting the deployment, sort of the deployment on the server itself, Postgres, is, as you can see, it's pretty simple. As long as you don't try to, you know, be cute and do something smart. Just do the defaults and you'll probably be just fine. Most people do not have requirements beyond the very defaults. Now something that tends to take a little bit more thinking is the actual communications between your application and Postgres. Because once you get in there, again, you need to make sure that you can just replay or you can read the data or copy the data or things like that. Uh, but really the first thing to think again here is choosing the right tools, right? Do you really need it? Like, what's the attack vector? Do you actually care about securing the communications? Well, if your application is running on the same server, probably not. Because again, if someone is root on your server, you've already lost. If it's in the same rack with a, you know, a crossover cable, maybe that's acceptable as well. Because again, if someone wants to break into that, they're already standing next to your server, they can just you know, take it and leave. Uh, if it's in your LAN, within your organization, is it a problem or not? Depends on your organization. If it's a publicly internet-facing one, then yes. There's really no questioning. You really need to secure the communication in that case. Uh, because there is an overhead, whichever method you choose, right? There will be an overhead of securing your communications. It's an overhead you should pay if you need it. But it's an overhead you should not pay if you don't actually need it. Uh, which, unfortunately, uh, a lot of people are not doing. Uh, there's a whole bunch of ways of doing this, right? Physical security is obviously the easiest. Just look everything in one building and put an armed guard outside. And then we can just run clear text for everything. But obviously anything like VPN deployments or IPsec deployments, uh, you may already have requirements elsewhere in the organization. Uh, this is an increasing number of organizations that just IPsec encrypt everything. Like all host-to-host -host communications are IPsec encrypted because you can and then everything is secure and you have a single security boundary for your whole system. And if you have that, it makes perfect sense. Right? And it's not that hard to deploy today. And once you've done it, you're in a good position because you don't need to tune the security of the individual products. Uh, and then, of course, we have the part that Postgres actually provides as a service for you, which is the ability to SSL encrypt the specific Postgres connections. Uh, depending on what deployment is, it's easier or harder, but if, if what you're trying to serve is like, you know, rogue warriors with laptops connecting to the database, using a VPN might just be simpler, because they probably need a VPN anyway to access other things. But it's Postgres specific, the thing that we do support and provide is SSL encryption of the connection. Now, Postgres SSL today is open SSL only. Sorry, that's what it is. Uh, we, you know, we all love to hate open SSL right now. Now we're going to see so many more security vulnerabilities found in open SSL now that someone finally you know, had the guts to look at it. Uh, but that's the way it looks. There are people working literally right now. I think Hickey, who will speak here later today, has actually sent a patch in again. I think it's the fourth generation of someone sending in a patch to support multiple SSL libraries. We're not there yet, but we are going to get there. Uh, obviously, like every other uh, SSL service, you need a certificate and a key on the server, and that's actually pretty much all you need. Once you have that, you get SSL. Now, you don't necessarily get all you need, but you get SSL and it's up and working. Now, Postgres has some interesting defaults, which is by default, SSL is disabled on the server even if you install the keys. Unless you run on Debian or Ubuntu, in which case they enable it for you by default, every time, everywhere. Uh, but Postgres default is to have it off. However, on the client, it's enabled by default. So there's a mismatch in those two. Disable on the server, it's enabled on the client. Only it's only partially enabled on the client. Uh, now the certificates when we're using SSL with Postgres, the server certificate is mandatory. You cannot run an SSL service without having a server certificate. You probably should not use like a public CA, you know, go to VeriSign or, or Thought or one of those and buy a certificate for your database server. That's probably a bad idea. Uh, because frankly, you probably you should not have completely untrusted machines 
unknown machines connected to your database. For a web server, that's exactly what we have. You know, we have random browsers around the world connecting, so we need a public certificate. For a database server, it'll typically be our application servers. Or maybe our own organizational laptops or something like that will be connecting. It's the devices that are known. So don't use a public CA. Create your own local. If you already have a CA in your organization, by all means, use that. But don't use a public one. Uh, So-called snake oil certificates or self-signed certificates will work just fine. Postgres has no reason not to work with that. You lose the man in the middle protection. That's just a factor of how these certificates work in SSL. People will be able to hijack the connection. But you still get encryption. So it depends on sort of what you're really protecting against. But the general thing here is make sure use a custom or dedicated CA to do it. There are trivial packages on Linux, there are trivial packages on BSD. Um, I think it's even included in Windows if you're running Active Directory, you can get a CA, just use that. It's only a little bit of extra work and a lot of extra security because you get the ability to do a whole lot of things. Now to actually start running SSL uh, on Postgres, it's very simple. You go into your postgres.conf, you say, say SSL equals on, unless again you're on Debian or Ubuntu, in which case they already did that for you, so it's already on. You put a file called server.key and a file called server.crt inside your data directory. Uh, be very careful about the permissions of this. This is again not a Postgres specific thing, but if someone gets to those files, they can hijack all your connections, they can access all your data. So they're very secret files, they're very sensitive files. They should obviously you know, be in a mode that nobody else can read them. <clears throat> and this is the same, if you have, you have the same kind of files for your Apache or, or Nginx or whatever you're running, and obviously it's the same level of security that's required, then you just restart Postgres and it works. Okay, now you have SSL. Now Postgres SSL negotiation works a bit different than you may be used to. Uh, if you look at, for example, Apache or, or any web, you have HTTP and you have HTTPS. They run on different ports, one is encrypted, one is unencrypted. Now Postgres, when it makes a connection, when the client makes a connection to the server, it will negotiate whether to use SSL. It's always on the same port. So you can't say firewall saying, hey, this port is encrypted, Postgres, that's the only thing I'm going to allow. It's on the same port. Uh, what happens is basically the server provides SSL capabilities and the client decides whether it should use it. So the server starts by saying, hello, I'm a Postgres server and I can do SSL, or and I can't do SSL. And then the client decides whether it's going to use that fact and actually use SSL or actually not use SSL. Uh, this is controlled by the SSL mode parameter, as some of you may have run into that's on the client side. Uh, and this SSL mode parameter is kind of silly. Uh, the default value is prefer. Uh, this is a really stupid default, because it really doesn't make a lot of sense. What it says is, let's try to do SSL if it's possible, but if it's not possible, just keep sending things in clear text. Which means you get no guarantees whatsoever, right? Uh, I have this little table here of things that you can see. That, uh, the, there are six different modes. You can say disable, allow, Prefer, require, verify CA, and verify fault. These are the different SSL modes that are supported. Uh, and as you can see, the first two columns here are what, what it protects against. What protects against eavesdropping, and what protects against man in the middle. And as you can see, prefer doesn't actually protect against anything. Because if it were to use encryption, it would be protected, yes. But it doesn't guarantee that there will be encryption. So basically, it doesn't protect you against anything. The interesting thing over here is the performance overhead, right? If you, if you turn SSL off, you don't get the overhead. If you say SSL allow, it means the client will do SSL if the server insists upon it. So we'll say we'll pay the overhead if necessary. Now prefer says we'll pay the overhead if possible without getting any actual security benefits. That's kind of silly, and it's the default. Now if you actually want to get guarantees, you need to put at least require or you need to put verify CA or verify full in it to get that. So the client may have SSL enabled by default, but it's not enabled in a fully secure way. If you actually need the encryption, you need to change this value on the client. Now the difference is, is require just says there needs to be encryption. Right? It does not care about the certificate at all. If you set it to verify CA, the client will verify that the server certificate is valid in the CA organization. Verify full will also match that the server's name matches the name on the certificate. 
between those two, it does depend on exactly how you set up your CA and things like that. But you want to use one of those two to get the full uh, security level on it. Now this is the other thing, right? The client decides on a security feature? That sounds really broken, doesn't it? And it kind of is. But the fact is, the client decides, but the server can reject software. So the client can decide to say, I don't need encryption. And then the server can say, well, okay, then go away. You're not allowed to connect. Uh, for this, we use pghba.conf that I'm sure you've all run into. And we use the matching road type that's host SSL. So basically, your typical or we only do SSL over TCP, which kind of makes sense, right? Why would you do it locally? So you replace, you typically have a row up here that says host. You replace that with host SSL, and now this row will only match if the client's encrypted. So if you change all your host rows in your HPA file to say host SSL, if an unencrypted client connects, it won't be allowed to log in. You should always use host SSL if you're in an SSL deployment, always. Should be not a single host line in your config file. Well, okay, maybe there should be one for local host, but that's pretty much it. But when you're using SSL, you should be having host SSL here. That's the way that the server guarantees that it will only accept you know, secure clients. And you really need that guarantee to have a secure system because it's the server that houses your data. It will allow anybody to connect to the SSL, set up an SSL session, and then authenticate. Uh, if you require a client certificate, you just add the parameter client cert equals one to your, again, PGHBA line, so you can have different rules for different hosts. Uh, it will only require at this point that the client certificate exists and is trusted by the same CA. It doesn't actually verify the contents of the client certificate. But again, if you're running this in your organizational CA, you shouldn't be issuing certificates to people who shouldn't be allowed to log in, right? And if you're using a public CA, this is an excellent reason why you shouldn't be using the public CA. Because in this case, I could use my web server certificate to log into your database. You probably didn't intend that. Uh, if you actually do use client certificates all the way through, uh, the default in Postgres is to accept a PAM format file for your certificates, just a file in your home directory by default, in called Postgres. But it also supports any open SSL compatible engine, as they call it. Which means basically if you have a smart card driver or a smart card reader with a driver that's compatible with OpenSSL, you can use that and just tell Postgres the certificate is on the smart card. And OpenSSL is going to read it from the smart card instead. So you can do very secure handling of your client certificates with it if you need. But again, by default, it only requires it to exist. And then it will perform a regular authentication once it's in there. Uh, which brings me up to the next part, which is exactly that, authentication. Uh, there are a couple of simple rules. Like the first thing there is make sure when we talk about authentication, this is the Postgres connection authentication, not the end user authentication. Right? And it's about making sure that it is the correct user that's on the other side that's trying to connect and that they can prove that they are. Uh, so I'm going to take a step back and say one thing, which is step into the whole secure Postgres applications part. Right? Uh, because about the authorization and the roles you're in and all that kind of stuff, I said I wasn't going to talk about that, but I'm just going to talk about one thing. Do not ever use the super user. Ever. Right? Nobody should ever log into your database using super user. Basically, allowing someone to do that disables all security in the system. The super user can do things like run arbitrary code. They can replace the security configuration in any way they want. Right? So basically, letting someone log in as super user <coughs> disables all security in the system, both now and for the future, since they can change the configuration. Don't ever do that. Unfortunately, it's way too common that you see you know, web apps just running as the super user because it's easiest. And yes, it is easiest, but it is also very, very stupid. So don't ever do that. So, going back to the authentication, I prove that people are not supposed to be the super user. Uh, in Postgres, I'm sure you run into it. Postgres supports a lot of different methods using this technology that we call host-based authentication. Uh, in a lot of installations, you can combine multiple methods to make something that's really secure. And the sort of main rule around it is just, don't just dump it down. Don't just you know, go for the lowest common denominator. But actually look at what these 
system provides. Because with a very little bit of extra effort, you can get a lot of extra security in your system. Uh, and basically, I'm sure, uh, has anyone in here never seen a pghpa.com file? Okay, that's kind of what I thought. Uh, the general idea is we have a top to bottom file where we can filter on a combination of connection type user, database, and connection source. And both firewall the connections, having access to this extra information, and also decide how this user should be authenticated. Uh, so you can look at an example like this that says, you know, if the user matches this, um, that's an unfortunate cutoff point. It's supposed to say peer. I promise you it says peer on my screen over here. <laughs> it's just a little bit too wide. Uh, and then you see here is a classic one of those host SSL lines. It says only encrypted connections, etc. Uh, I'm actually not going to go through all of the rows here, uh, mainly because I'm about to run out of time. And of course, update manager is not covering my slide. And if nothing matches, and this is an important note, if nothing matches in this file, the user connection will be rejected. Use that. Like, what you can do is you can save this row and basically say that 0.0.0.0 slash .0, .0, .0, 0 which is the internet, can do an MD5 password based login and now you've done Postgres down to work the same as every other database. Don't do that. Use the fact that you can actually get uh, extra features out of this. Again, there are a number of authentication methods in Postgres. It's actually quite a few of them. Some are internal, some of them are fully external, um, some of them are uh, OS integrated, and some of them are really, really stupid. We provide those as well. It's to see, it's, it's a test for you, right? If you use them, you know, you are not worthy. Or something like that. For example, there is an authentication method that is called trust. What it means is trust everyone. You know, there's nobody mean out there on the internet. Nobody's trying to hack you. Okay, that's just a myth. Uh, what it basically says that whoever connects to the database can just say who they are and we will trust them. They say, hey, I am the super user, then we'll just trust them and give them super user privileges. This is not a good idea. In fact, this is a really, really bad idea. It turns off, again, all security is turned off. Don't do that. Uh, I sort of, in my days, I found a single use case where trust makes sense. Does anyone want to give a chance at guessing what the single use case I found where trust actually makes sense? Go stand in a corner and shame. You are correct here. Yes, resetting your password. Basically, if you lose your super user password, you have no choice. If you are on Windows. If you are on any platform other than Windows, you have a choice. But if you are on Windows and you lose your super user permissions, then this is your only way to recover it. So what you do is temporarily allow trust, log in, change it, and turn it off again. Don't forget this turning it off again part. I've seen people do that too, but generally if you find trust, change it. Get rid of it. Consider it a security bug if you are using trust anywhere. That's really, really bad. Now what you'll probably, if you install Postgres on Linux, for example, you'll find your default being an authentication method called peer. Uh, this one is only available over Unix sockets. Again, sorry if you're on Windows, sorry if you're a Java application, because the Java platform doesn't support it, even if it's on Unix. Uh, but Peer will authenticate by basically, it only works on local connections, and it will ask your local operating system kernel, who is on the other end of this connection? Now, if you don't trust your local operating system kernel, you have a bigger problem. Right? You are, have already lost. This is, by the way, how you recover your super user password if you're on Unix. Use Peer. Now you can log in. But on the other hand, if you're on Unix, you should probably just use this and not even have a super user password. Because again, if you cannot trust your local kernel, you've lost anyway. So this is basically the highest security connection that you can make to Postgres. You should pretty much always have this on the line in PGHBA that says local users. The very basic one we have, and the simplest authentication method called MD5. That's the, your typical username password. It's called MD5 because it uses the double hashed MD5. It does one hash on the client and one hash on the server. The important thing to know here, there is another authentication method that is called password. If you use that, stop using it. It will send your password in clear text and it will store your password in clear text. You probably didn't want that. 
don't use it. If you want passwords, use MD5. It's a little bit tricky that we're calling them differently. In fact, um, the only reason the password method exists is to make another deprecated feature work. So if you see password authentication, get rid of it. You don't want that. Uh, we have a couple of integrated options as well. Uh, you can do LDAP authentication with Postgres. Uh, to a Postgres client, it looks like a password. So you'll get a regular password prompt at the client, which has the advantage that you don't need any special client support. The client won't even know that you're using LDAP. It'll just get a password prompt. And Postgres will take that and just send the question off to an LDAP server, either using a prefix suffix, just constructing a URL, or connecting to the server, searching for the user, and then trying to authenticate with that user. And now there are a few things to know about LDAP. One of them is that the password is in clear text. Okay, the password between the Postgres client and the Postgres server, if you're using LDAP, is clear text. Why is it clear text? Because Postgres server needs the password in order to send it to the LDAP server. Therefore, you should be using host SSL. Right? You should only be using this if you're on local connections or SSL. Never use it on a regular host connection. You should also set the flag LDAP TLS equals 1 on the HBA file. That will make Postgres encrypt the password when it's talking to the LDAP server. Otherwise, it will go in clear text between Postgres and the LDAP server. That may or may not be a problem. That depends on what the network looks like towards your LDAP server. But if you're on a, on a network where you need the encryption, you need to set both of these. Again, it's something you need to look through. Uh, it will, in this case, apply things like password policies of the LDAP server, not of the Postgres server. It will only do authentication, so it's not going to you know, copy over all your group memberships or something like that. If you need that, you need to write a little cron job that synchronizes things. Uh, a more advanced integrated authentication method is uh, GSS or SSPI. Uh, this is Kerberos based standardized protocol, uh, particular GSS API. Uh, this includes full support for Active Directory if you're in an organization that has that. Probably the by far most widely deployed Kerberos server uh, in the environment today. Now the difference here is this provides you with single sign-on, so there is no password prompt to the client. The idea is this basically once you've logged into the client, you're logged into the whole system, you'll automatically be logged into the database, whether your client is you know, a Windows laptop or your Unix machine or whatever. Basically the idea behind Kerberos is when you log in, you get a ticket that the Kerberos system signs that says this person is trusted as being Magnus. And then whenever you connect somewhere, it'll just present that ticket saying, hey, here's the guy who's proven that I'm Max. It's actually a very, very secure protocol. It's designed to run secure authentication across the internet. So across completely insecure networks. Now, there is another authentication method that's called KRB5. If you're using that, it's time to start migrating away from it. That's a, the same sort of basic authentication in a non-standard protocol. Postgres 9.4 will remove this. It's been deprecated since 8.3, so it's been deprecated for a while, but it will actually be removed in 9.4. Uh, SSPI is a, a classic Microsoft embrace and extend version of GSS. If your environment is entirely Windows, you can use SSPI, and the advantage is it's already set up for you. You don't have to do anything to set it up, you just enable it and it works. No extra work. Uh, we have an authentication method called Radius. Uh, that's basically, again, it's just like LDAP, it looks like a password to the client, but it will send the password off to a Radius server. Uh, Radius today is very typically used in one-time password solutions. If you have these little tokens that generate the one-time password, Radius is a protocol that they pretty much all support. Uh, again, passwords in clear text, only use over SSL connections. Now, the password to the Radius server is encrypted for the shared secret, but the password between the Postgres client and the Postgres server is not. Uh, we have an authentication method called CERT as well, which is a certificate-based login, in which case we will now take this client certificate that you requested and we'll read the username out of it uh, using the CN attribute. And again, any engine by OpenSSL. So this can give you a very secure... It can be pretty complex to set up and get running, but it will get you something that is very secure. Um, I'm speeding up a little bit because I'm running out of time, sorry. Um, the, I have a couple of minutes. Excellent. Uh, we also support something called username mapping. As you can see, some of these systems were external, right? We could use a certificate or 
uh, Active Directory or something. Now, any external systems that provide you with the username. So the difference here is if, if Postgres goes to talk to, to uh, GSS, for example, GSS will come back and say, this is Magnus. What if I want to be able to log in with a different username in Postgres? This is when we use username mapping. Same thing for a peer. If I ask the local kernel who's on the other side of this, I don't control the username. Whereas if I'm using LDAP, for example, actually the client provides the username that gets sent externally. So for peer, for GSS, and for cert, we allow either static or pattern mapping saying this user in the external authentication system is allowed to log in as a different user in Postgres. Uh, Actually, how you use it is fairly simple. You have in your uh, PGHBA, you have something like map equals and the name of a map, which has again been cut off, but we'll live with that. Uh, and then you create a pgident.conf. It's one of those, it's named that because in the early days, only the ident authentication method supported this. More of them supported now, but the file is still named like that. And then you just create, so for each one, uh, the first column here is the name of the map, local there, that's the thing that I have up here, that's been cut off. And then I just say, the user root in the operating system is allowed to log in as the user Postgres. And then I can say, you know, the user Magnus in the operating system is also allowed to log in as the user Postgres. Maybe that's a bad idea. I'm not sure I'm to be trusted. Uh, and again, you can also do pattern matching. This is a very typical thing for certificates. So this is the cert, that's up here with this certificate login. If the mapping here starts with a slash, it will do a regular expression match. And then you can use back references. Here you just say, well, if there's a CN equals in the CN name, that's a classic mistake, that the CN field contains the name CN equals something, you can just remove that and back reference into this. Uh, another typical thing on certificates is you have maybe username at domain.com in the CN. You can just create a single line here that just removes the app domain that call and lets them log in. Uh, that tends to be a lot more efficient than listing every single one of your users in this PGA dance. Uh, but it is for mapping between these two systems. So again, using these authentication methods, use the right way, and you can lock things up a little bit more. <clears throat> so let's try to wrap this up a little bit. What about this secure Postgres deployment thing? The first thing you need to start with are these hard things, right? You need to determine what you actually need. Like, what are your requirements? What are your trust levels? Who do you actually trust? Server hosters, cloud providers, network providers, you know, building maintenance. These are all actually there. What's your actual attack surface? Where can users or where can attackers get at you? Even potentially by breaking through another system, how can they get to you? What are the actual threat vectors? Like where do you need to focus? Because you can probably spend you know, months of securing a vector that nobody's ever going to hit. Put the efforts in the right place and deploy the correct countermeasures. Right? Uh, this whole idea of, I, I think it's a general tool, like the checkbox featuring, going like, yes, we do encryption. And then you do it crappily. That's just useless. But you spend a lot of time implementing it. But you need to actually design these things. And again, you need to actually lock all the doors. It makes no sense to have you know, excellent, perfect locks on the front door when you don't even have a back door. It's just open. Uh, typical example is, why bother encrypting? Why bother encrypting your SSL connections if someone can just take your hard drive and walk away with it? If you have building security, they can do that. But if you just have a random server, they can do that. But why require smart cards for login and then send all your data in clear text? It's just easier to intercept the data instead. Uh, so get it at the right level, and as always, and this is of course not a Postgres specific one, deploy layered security, right? Don't fall for the good old, I have a firewall so I am secure, right? A firewall does not protect you that well. On the other hand, that doesn't mean you shouldn't have a firewall. You should have a firewall as well, because it's very easy to deploy, and it takes away a lot of the simple attackers. But a firewall in general does not actually protect your system that well. And if you design your system based on, you know, I have a firewall, then once that firewall breaks or if someone gets through it, you have nothing. And you're completely screwed. Uh, there are a couple of those sort of Postgres specific ones that are just really too simple to mention, like don't use trust. Like really don't. Use PGHPA in a smart way. Don't set everything to 0000 and be 5 and just say, oh, because then I don't have to think about it. Do simple login, login saying, you know, super user is only allowed to log in for the local machine. 
Only the web server user is allowed to actually log in from the web server. The DBAs are only allowed to log in from these specific IP addresses, which is where their office line is, or something like that. And mix the authentication maze in the right way. Use SSL if you have to, right? It takes some work to set it up, but if you need it, it's worth it. Now, if you don't need it, don't pay the overhead. So basically, if you're on a Debian or Ubuntu and you don't need it, go turn it off again. Because by default, they will encrypt your local host connections, and that probably doesn't help you. But it costs a lot. It's actually, I like it like it's a consultant neighbor. There's more than once I've come up to a customer who has a really bad performing system. I go in and turn off SSL, and it's fine. It's like, you know, easy money, but it's kind of boring to have to do that. They were running like a Java application across the local host interface or something like that. It never makes sense to encrypt local host. Uh, and remember that the security really is an iterative process. Okay. You are never done. It's not like, oh, I've set up my HPA file and enabled SSL, now I'm secure. It's something that you have to go through all the time and reevaluate because your requirements change and the security landscape change all the time. Maybe someone deployed a new system on the server right next to it. Someone can now break in through that system if you didn't secure your, your network IP base, for example. So remember, you're never done, you just keep going over and over and over again. And that's it for now, I think. How are we doing? Do we still have time for a couple of questions? We have five minutes for a couple of questions. We have time for a couple of questions. So, questions from anyone? Well, that's a good one.